Many people think that Mark's Gospel was the first of the Gospels to be written. Although the canonical order of the four Gospels is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, there is very strong evidence really that Mark comes first. One of the striking features of Mark's Gospel is that the words that it used, the way it tells some of the main stories, um, are reflected also in Matthew and Luke. And over the years, scholars have come to the conclusion that one of the best explanations for this is that Matthew and Luke had some form of Mark's Gospel in front of them while they were writing their own. Of course, the scholarship on precisely how Matthew, Mark and Luke wrote their Gospels is enormously complex and not for our discussion today. But it is worth just noting that many people do think that some form of Mark's Gospel was there before Matthew and Luke wrote theirs. If that is the case, then that would make Mark one of the earliest of the Gospels to have been written. Evidence for the dating of Mark's Gospel, however, is much more difficult to be able to identify. There is some interesting accounts in the second century, quite early on in the second century, which suggests that um, Mark's Gospel was written by someone called John Mark under the influence of Peter. It's only tradition, however, and we're really not quite sure how reliable that kind of tradition is. In terms of the dating of Mark's Gospel itself um, and the evidence that you find within the Gospel, there's very little to point us definitely to one date and not to another date. But the key piece of information comes in Mark 13. Mark 13 verse 2 refers to the destruction of the temple. Now the temple was destroyed by the Romans in the 70 AD when the Romans um, fought an extended war against the Jews known as the Jewish War and eventually took Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. The question that exercises quite a lot of scholars is whether Mark 13 um, is reflecting a situation that has already happened or whether it is looking forward to a situation that will happen in the future. Those who think that Mark 13 verse 2 reflects something that has just happened would probably date Mark's Gospel to the early 70s, so something around 72 or 73 AD. Whereas those who think that Mark's Gospel must be reflecting a prophecy of what would happen would date Mark's Gospel to just before 70, so 67 or 68. So therefore, although we're not entirely sure when Mark was written, you've got this kind of broad window of dating, which dates somewhere between 67 AD and 73 AD. Um, and most people would identify Mark as falling either on one side of the Jewish war or the other side. However, there's almost no definite external or internal evidence to be able to point us exactly to when Mark's Gospel was written. But we think it was probably around this period, around the Jewish war. So that gives you one initial impression of Mark's Gospel, which is important, which is that it was the first of the Gospels to be written. When you read Mark's Gospel, compared to Matthew and Luke's Gospel, the first thing that strikes you is Mark's Gospel is a lot shorter than Matthew and Luke. So Mark's Gospel is only 16 chapters to Luke's 24 and Matthew's 28. So therefore, Luke's story is shorter than Matthew and Luke. That gives you the sense that Matthew, Mark's Gospel is somehow more immediate. And if you read the way in which the story is told in Mark, you certainly get that kind of flavour, where Mark's favourite word, apparently, is immediately. Over and over again, he says, and immediately, and immediately. And it gives you that sense that he is writing at pace. He's getting through the gospel quickly and with enthusiasm. The question of why he does this, however, um, there are all sorts of different explanations for why he might do that. It may just be his style and may tell you nothing about when he was writing or why he was writing. But some people suggest that it does indicate that there is an eyewitness account standing behind his writing and that the and immediately are Peter's enthusiastic remembrances of precisely what happened during Jesus' life. We can't be entirely sure, but it certainly is an attractive idea that you have Peter striding around a room saying and the next thing that happened, which gives you the flavour of what's going on in Mark's Gospel. It's worth noting, though, that although Mark's Gospel is shorter in terms of overall length, whenever you come across a passage which is then repeated in Matthew and Luke's Gospel, Matthew's account is always the longer account. And it's, very worth, it's really worth noting that Mark's account is always the more extended to Matthew's and Matthew and Luke's shorter accounts. So the length of the Gospel of Matthew and Luke is to do with the fact that they have much, much more material in and not because they have an extended storytelling style. It's Mark who has the extended storytelling style. And therefore, that gets us into something really important about appreciating Mark's Gospel. For many years, because Mark was considered to be the earliest Gospel, a lot of attention was paid to Matthew and Luke and their theological emphasis. 
So some of the aspects that you discover of people exploring Matthew and Luke will be they will have a look at what the particular theological concerns are. So Matthew's gospel is by many people regarded as more of the Jewish gospel and people will explore the theological concerns of Matthew through the lens of Judaism. Luke's gospel is regarded much more as a Gentile gospel and therefore some of the theological concerns of Luke through the lens of, gen of Gentile worship are considered to be very important. As a result, for many years, Mark's gospel was in a sense the poor cousin to the other two synoptic gospels because Matthew and Luke's theological themes were looked at with great consideration. Mark's were much less important and much less explored by people. In the past few decades, however, 20 to 30 years, people have begun to realise that that is an oversight and that although Mark is very much a narrative gospel and does tell its story with enthusiasm and with great joy, actually Mark also has a theological strand and Mark does his theology through his storytelling. So one of the things it's worth bearing in mind is that Mark's gospel can be understood quite dynamically and interestingly as a narrative. The scholarship that's done therefore on Mark's gospel is often called narrative criticism because what people do in that is try to have a look at how the narrative tells the theology that Mark is trying to communicate, which gets us back to Mark as the longer account. As I've said already, whenever you compare Mark and Matthew and Luke's accounts together, Mark's is the longer account. So the interesting question is, why is it the longer account? One explanation is that Matthew and Luke stripped information out, but it seems to be hard to explain why Matthew and Luke would take details out of the account. Much more likely seems to be the fact that Mark has put information in rather than Matthew and Luke have taken information out. And therefore it is some of the details that he puts in that becomes really important for understanding Mark's gospel. So one of the things it's worth doing whenever you're reading Mark's gospel is to compare Mark with Matthew and Luke and to see the places where Mark does in fact put in a lot more detail and gives you the much more vivid picture of what's going on in the narrative. One of the very striking occasions where this is done, and it is a very famous account and many people will know about it already, is the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark's Gospel, where Mark has some really quite key additional details that he tells you. The most famous of all being that Mark tells, them, tells us that the 5,000 sat down on the green grass, which to our mind is an entirely unnecessary piece of information. Living in Britain or in anywhere else where it rains regularly, you know that grass is always green. But actually, if you live in the Holy Land, you'll realise that this small piece of information is a very important piece of information because grass is only green for certain periods of the year in the Holy Land. So therefore, Mark is beginning to tell you something really quite significant about when the remembered account of when the feeding of the 5,000 took place. So you get those little details which become quite interesting and important. But Mark does other things which I think are even more striking in trying to understand his theology. One of the things that you notice as you read all the way through Mark's Gospel is that there are three groups of characters that come back again and again through Mark's Gospel. There are the scribes and the Pharisees. And one of the things you notice all the way through Mark's Gospel in a much less differentiated way than you find in Matthew and Luke is that whenever the scribes and the Pharisees appear as a group in Mark, and it's important that there is a group and not individuals, but whenever they do appear as a group, they invariably respond negatively to Jesus. They mutter among themselves, they blaspheme among themselves, they criticise Jesus and say, who does this person think that he is? So the scribes and the Pharisees become this very negative group within Mark's Gospel. Another group who are very striking in Mark's Gospel is the crowd. Again, if you read your way through Mark's Gospel, you'll discover that the crowd appear again and again and again in Mark's Gospel. And invariably, when the crowd appears, the crowd are amazed. It's quite remarkable the number of times the crowd is made in, amazed in Mark's Gospel. And um, one of the really striking things is that the crowd seems to follow Jesus around going, we've never seen anything like this before. So you get almost a pantomime edge to Mark's Gospel, which I think is really striking where you get groups of characters who come on and you know how they're always going to respond because they always respond like that. Scribes come on and you almost know to say boo because they're going to be the baddies. The crowd come on and they wander around Jesus being very amazed. There is a third group, however, and the third group are probably the key to understanding why Mark paints the scribes and the crowd in the way that he does. 
because the third group is the disciples. And the third group therefore followed Jesus, very strikingly at the start of Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, come follow me, and of course they do. Our assumption then is that they are going to follow Jesus throughout the whole of his life and to understand what he's doing, to comprehend what's going on, and then to rush off at the end of the Gospel to proclaim exactly what Jesus wants them to proclaim. In striking contrast to that, one of the things that you notice over and over again in Mark's Gospel is precisely that the disciples do not understand. Time and time again, they miss the point, they don't comprehend, they ask stupid questions, and it's almost as though they haven't understood what's going on. So we have the three groups in Mark's Gospel. You have the scribes, the Pharisees, who are regularly negative, you have the crowds who are regularly amazed, and you have the disciples who are regularly uncomprehending. So the question is, why does Mark portray his gospel in that kind of sense? And as you read your way through the gospel, one of the things that comes out very, very clearly is that it is a gospel which is reflecting on the nature of response to Jesus. And so therefore what you have are these three big groups who are responding to Jesus in their different ways. And I think underlying a lot of Mark's narrative is the question of, and how are you going to respond? Are you going to respond to Jesus like the scribes and the Pharisees did? Are you going to describe like, um, respond to Jesus like the crowds who are amazed but actually then do nothing? And very importantly, once Jesus has got into Jerusalem in the last week of his life, and having just had the crowd say, this is the, this is the one, um, suddenly turn their back on Jesus and condemn him to crucifixion. Or are you going to behave like the disciples who are uncomprehending all the way through Jesus?